very good evening to one and all and welcome to the session for today where we have with us professor john plain fellow of the royal society and also the professor of atmospheric chemistry faculty of engineering and physical sciences school of chemistry university of leeds with us and he's there with us to enlighten all of us on a very interesting topic cosmic dust in planetary atmospheres and this special public lecture is part of the joint science promotion activities initiative of the national academy of sciences india delhi chapter and the india upadhyay college university of delhi under the aegis of the dbt star college program nasi that is the national academy of sciences india is the oldest science academy of india and currently professor Ajoy Khatak is the president of the NASI, and Professor Rak Sharma is the chairperson of the NASI Delhi chapter. So, before inviting Professor Plain to deliver his talk, let me briefly introduce him to all of you. Uh, he did his PhD in physical chemistry from University of Cambridge in 1984, and is currently professor of atmospheric chemistry, University of Leeds. He was director of the research in chemistry, University of Leeds, from 2009 to 2020, and during 2012 to 2017, was ERC Advanced Fellow, University of Leeds. His research interests are kinetics and photochemistry, aeronomy and atmospheric chemistry, atmospheric remote sensing, planetary and interstellar chemistry, and he has published more than 370 papers in peer-reviewed international journals, including two papers in Science and seven in the Nature series. 16 book chapters in edited research monographs and his citation statistics is more than 18000 his age index is 70 and has supervised 29 phd students as primary supervisors and 23 postdocs he has received total research of 12.1 million us dollars funding in the last 10 years and has received the royal society of chemistry medal for reaction kinematics and mechanism 2005 Royal Society of Chemistry Tilden Medal 2006, National Science Foundation Sidar Prize 2007, E.G. William Bridges Medal for Atmospheric Science 2017, and he is elected Fellow of the American Geophysical Union in 2017. He is also elected as a Fellow of the Royal Society in the year 2020. He is on several national and international research committees since 2010. like european research council or system science advanced grants panel us national science foundation upper atmosphere steering committee german dfg course program review panel nasa senior review panel for heliospheric science international advisory board of the max planck institute us national center for atmospheric research advisory panel so he is there with us to discuss cosmic dust in planetary atmospheres with these words i now invite professor plain to kindly share his screen to deliver his talk right good is that okay it's absolutely fine perfect right well it's a great pleasure to uh, be giving this talk today um It's quite a far-ranging talk. It involves physics, chemistry, engineering, electronics, um, modeling, and so on. So, um, I'll be covering a lot of ground. Um, not all of it in um, in great depth, but obviously very happy to answer <clears throat> questions immediately after the lecture or subsequently via uh, email. So, what this? Um, oh no, this is not. I think. my i need to just uh try the uh this is decided not to scan forward let me just try this again uh, if i share this it might work better uh share this did of course work a moment ago but um let's see now Right on we go. So, over the last ten years or so, I've attempted to answer what seems to be a very simple question, and that is how much cosmic dust comes into our atmosphere every day. And um, 
of course, if you know what that amount is, then you can answer other questions like, you know, why does it matter? Why does one, is it an interesting question? And so exactly a decade ago, I published a review which looked into all of the estimates that had been made before then. And you see that um, these uh, estimates ranged by two orders of magnitude, somewhere between three and 300 tons a day, which is obviously not uh, a very good position to be in. And um, so I set to work with a team of people at the University of Leeds who are listed over here, as well as an international team of collaborators. Uh, the work was mostly funded by the uh, European Research Council with an advanced grant and then also by the UK Science and Technology Research Council and Natural Environment Research Council. And um, <clears throat> just to sort of start at the beginning, what do I mean by cosmic dust and where does it come from? When a star evolves to be near the end of its life, um, it become, or they often become um, a red giant star um, or an asymptotic uh, branch star. And uh, dust is created around the star and expelled into the interstellar medium. This is an actual picture up here. There you can see is one of these um, AGB stars surrounded by a cloud of dust. And inside that dust, new stars start to form. Uh, and in turn, uh, they will create uh, solar systems uh, out of the cloud of dust around the protostar <clears throat> that's formed over here. And this is really what my lecture is going to be about, is this system here. But eventually that star will get old uh, after several billion years, swell up and become a giant red star and the cycle will resume. So this is a, uh, a recent uh, observation of one of these new solar systems forming made by this uh, telescope in the Atacama Desert in Chile the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, or ALMA. And here is a new solar system. So there is the protostar, which is called HL Tau, less than a million years old. And you can see in the disk of dust surrounding the star, these uh, tracks here, which is where dust has been um, converted into new planets. So they've hoovered up the dust, formed new planets by a process that's still an are challenging to explain why the dust sticks together. So that's a good research topic for the future. Um, anyway, that's what happens. And then in our solar system, which is now of course quite mature, um, we have sources of dust. Uh, the, the most prominent, as I'll show you, are so-called Jupiter family comets. So these are comets that have been captured from the outer solar system by Jupiter's enormous gravity. And they now um, orbit within uh, Jupiter's um, orbit. So they'll pass through the inner solar system where the Earth is every two years. Then between Mars and Jupiter is a lot of leftover material, they so the asteroid belt, which did not form new planets. And these range from some rocks that are a few hundred kilometers uh, across to smaller rocks. And when they collide with each other, that's another source of dust. And then there are the longer period comets, Halley-type comets, which will orbit into the outer solar system. And then there are objects that come from further afield, the um, Kuiper belt or even the Oort cloud. And at the end, I'll show you uh, the results of an Oort cloud comet. So these are all depositing dust in the inner solar system. This is uh, an actual photograph of Comet 67P that was visited by ESA's Rosetta mission. And here is one of the co-discoverers of it uh, posing at ESA with a model. And you can see that this um, has what's called a very low albedo, very low light reflection. It's really like a lump of coal because although it's mainly water ice, it's absolutely crammed full of dust. And when a comet approaches the sun, as shown here with another comet, Hartley 2, the water starts to evaporate along with other uh, volatile uh, gases. And these eject um, plumes of dust. 
Now, when that dust hits a planetary atmosphere, there's an easy rule of thumb of where it's going to burn up. Uh, and that is where the pressure is around one microbar, a, a bar being uh, the atmospheric pressure at the Earth's surface, um, just to sort of um, put that into perspective. So on the Earth, this is around 95 kilometers. And so this here on Earth is around the edge of space. So here we have the atmosphere, and then we transition into the geospace environment. It's a little bit lower on Mars, thinner atmosphere, smaller planet. Venus is a bit higher than on Earth. Titan, which is one of Saturn's moons, it's 500 kilometers. That's because uh, being a moon, although the pressure at the surface on Titan is just like the Earth around a bar, it decreases very slowly. So if you're a cosmic dust particle hitting Titan, it's more like diving into a feather pillow, very soft landing. Whereas when you hit the atmospheres of these terrestrial planets, it's more like hitting a brick wall. And <clears throat> when I pulled together for that review, these um, different ways of estimating this flux, this simple bar um, uh, chart here shows that estimates, for example, of the amount of sodium that's injected into the atmosphere varied by a factor of 10. I'll show you how the LIDAR flux is measured later. This is a results of an astronomical model. This is a large uh, high performance radars and global modeling that I'll, I'll show a little bit more later. And if you go to iron, the global iron input, you see now the discrepancy is a factor of 50. So this is the amount of cosmic iron that is apparently accumulating in polar ice cores. There's the global modeling, the radar, and so on. So there's clearly a very big problem in uh, getting these estimates right. And so the uh, European Research uh, Council uh, project that I um, uh, ran for the last sort of six, six years or so called CODITA looked at this in detail all the way from interplanetary dust particles in the solar system, how they ablate, they give, that generates metal atoms and ions. These form particles which can then uh, be nuclei for clouds, ice clouds in the upper atmosphere, polar stratospheric clouds that destroy ozone, and even the surface deposition of iron, which is an essential biological nutrient. And in order to investigate this, <clears throat> we created a, a joined up model here. This is uh, the Leeds chemical ablation model. This creates a, an injection rate into the atmosphere. And then we have a whole atmosphere model from the surface to 140 kilometers to look at all of these different um, features in a self-consistent way. And there are <clears throat> obviously very different techniques that are used to interrogate these different phenomena here. You can see the radars, LIDARs, which is laser radar, rocket-borne instruments, satellites from space, aircraft, in the upper uh, troposphere and the lower stratosphere, so around 20 kilometers, and then ice cores that I mentioned already. And at Leeds, <clears throat> we were doing various laboratory studies to basically provide the underpinning fundamental science to understand when you, for example, look at something with a rocket, what are you actually seeing in terms of the charging of the, the atoms and ions, you need reaction kinetics up here. You need to simulate meteoric ablation. So I'll show you various aspects of that as we go along. And early on in the project, we identified six ways to try to, to nail down what this flux of cosmic dust is. One is to look <clears throat> at the dust in the near Earth environment, which I'll show you in a second. Another is using radar or LIDAR to actually look at ablating meteors. So these would be shooting stars although most of the dust doesn't provide, produce an optical phenomenon that you could see if you looked out on a dark night. So these are, can only be seen by radar. Um, you can look at global modeling of the metals that are left behind when the, the dust ablates in the upper atmosphere. You can actually now measure the vertical fluxes of atoms of things like sodium and iron in the upper atmosphere. So that gives you a more direct measure. You can also look at the accumulation of cosmic spherules in ice uh, at the poles. I'll, I'll show you later what a cosmic spherule is. And then there's also meteoric smoke that is deposited. Now, the ones that are in blue there are, are in the end, what we decided 
were the best way of getting at this number. And um, you will notice this is the only method that looks outside the atmosphere. Everything else here is basically interrogating different parts of the atmosphere for different phenomena that are created by the entry of cosmic dust. So this is a picture of the zodiacal light taken from uh, Chile looking out over the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the sun is below the horizon and it's illuminating this cloud of dust that occurs in the plane of the solar system. So this is telling us directly how much dust is near to the earth. And if you, uh, this is another picture here, if you take a cross section through here and plot the brightness as a function of ecliptic latitude. So that's going from above to below this invariant plane where the sun and all the planets are, you would get that black line. And these lines show the prediction of an astronomical model of what this distribution should be like. And <clears throat> there are the Jupiter family comets. These are the short ones, remember, that are inside Jupiter's orbit. And you see the red matches very well. That immediately tells you that much of the dust is coming from Jupiter family comets. The asteroids are, are rather narrow because they're generated quite near just beyond Mars. And these uh, Halley type comets much broader. So that's a clue straight away as to where most of the dust in the inner solar system comes from. When a particle hits the atmosphere, bits get knocked off, that's called sputtering, but eventually it hits enough um, air molecules at high speed that friction warms it up to the point that it ablates. And this occurs at 1700 or higher um, Kelvin temperature. The volatile elements ablate, sodium, potassium. When you get to around 2000 Kelvin, the main constituents, iron, magnesium, and silicon ablate. And then at about 2400 Kelvin, the so-called refractory cat elements, calcium, aluminium, titanium ablate. And then that would represent complete ablation. Now, depending on the size of the particle and how uh, rapidly it enters the atmosphere, it will go some way down this sequence of events here. And this is captured in this Leeds ablation model CABMOD, uh, which I will be referring to uh, as we go along. Now, at Leeds in my lab, we built um, a meteoric ablation simulator, uh, or the Massey. And this is designed to actually look at the ablation of individual metals from uh, meteoritic particles. So this is to test uh, this idea that I just showed you in cartoon form on the previous slide. So there's a, a tungsten filament here. We put some uh, meteoritic fragments, a few tens of microns in size on there. It is flash heated under computer control to uh, produce the same temperature ramp up to nearly 3000 Kelvin that the particle would encounter entering the atmosphere. We monitor that with the pyrometer. Um, we can follow everything with a camera looking down. And then we have two lasers tuned to optical transitions of the metal. So for sodium, it would be the well-known orange line at 589 nanometers. So we look at pairs of metals at a time as they ablate, and this is laser-induced fluorescence. So I may be able to make this work or not. Let's see. There was a video on here, but this may not be going to work. Let's, let's not worry about that. Um, hmm, pity. Uh, let's go on. Um, if you actually take a meteorite, and this is uh, the uh, well-known Allende meteorite, um, and uh, you then start to do um, X-ray analysis of where these different metals are, you see that silicon and iron are very evenly distributed throughout. But if you look at say nickel or sulfur, these are, there are only little um, grains of these metals. And in fact, iron, nickel, and sulfur are in separate phases from the main uh, phase, which is iron, uh, magnesium, silicon. So we treat all of this in the model. Uh, these are actually results here. This is just to show you that using this uh, simulator, we can look at different particle sizes and simulate entry at different speeds. If it enters very slowly, the minimum entry speed to the Earth's atmosphere uh, for orbital dynamical reasons is 11 kilometers a second. 
<clears throat> it doesn't heat up above 1500 Kelvin, so we see nothing ablate. On the other hand, if you have a big particle entering more rapidly, this heats right up to nearly 3000 Kelvin, and you see in this case both sodium and nickel ablating. So we can use this kind of data under real time. These, as you see, are, are occurring on the time scale that uh, you would have a, in a shooting star. We can now test the model CAB mod and uh, use that as our sort of tool. Now, what happens when these metals ablate is that they actually occur in layers up around 90 kilometers in the Earth's atmosphere. So here are four metals that can be observed. Uh, by, from the ground by the LIDAR technique, which I'll show in a moment how that works. And the first thing is you can see they're all peaking around 90 kilometers. They're quite narrow layers. Uh, the half width here is just a few kilometers, quite sharp um, underside and top side of the layer. Already what's interesting is calcium, which occurs in almost all minerals in a similar abundance to sodium is two orders of magnitude smaller. And that we have now shown using that meteoric ablation simulator is simply due to the fact that calcium is a very refractory metal. It forms a very stable um, oxide in this uh, melt. So we have an injection from ablation. And the question is, why do these metals occur at all? Because if you've done any chemistry at high school and you threw a bit of sodium into water, you know what happens. It's extremely reactive, and it is also in an oxidizing atmosphere. So below 85 kilometers, of all these metals are very rapidly oxidized into to, uh, carbonates, hydroxides, uh, what have you. And then in the ionosphere above 100 kilometers, they're all uh, exist as ions because metals have low ionization potential, so they just charge transfer with any um, other ions. But in this particular region here, there's lots of H and O atoms, and this part of our atmosphere is still reducing, unlike the lower atmosphere, which is now all oxidizing, unlike the early Earth. And so this is where um, the layers appear. And what I've just said is based on measuring the rate coefficients of all these reactions that are shown. I'm obviously not going to go through all of these. It's just to show you that this knowledge is built up over many years by measuring the rate coefficients for all of these reactions, putting them into a model, and then understanding why you get these um, layers of metal atoms. And we put that into a whole atmosphere model uh, called WACM, Whole Atmosphere Community Climate Model, and um, this shows, for example, how the column of sodium of the sodium layer varies with season at mid latitudes. You see it goes to the midsummer minimum, maximum in winter. This is the iron layer at uh, Wuhan in China. And you can see again, as a function of month and height, we have this layer minimum in summer. And that it shows that the mold works very well except we have to use a very small injection rate of uh, metals, which itself is interesting. Now, if you have a LIDAR system that can measure the metal concentration and the, the vertical uh, wind, the flux of, for instance, sodium is its concentration times the vertical wind, W. Um, and uh, if you average this over a period of time, you actually determine a downward flux. And this was uh, pioneered by one of my collaborators, Chet Gardner in the US. And this shows the vertical flux of iron and sodium. Um, so it's a negative flux. By convention, that means it's a downward flux. So ablation is occurring up here, and then you get this downward flux, <coughs> which peaks around 86 um, kilometers. And so this is one bit of hard evidence of the rate of input of cosmic dust. Another comes from uh, surface measurements. So this is the um, US uh, South Pole um, station, Amundsen Scott. And underneath this um, station is a very large water well. <coughs> excuse me, which uh, provides water for the base. So there's what you were looking at on the previous slide. And then there's this enormous cavity under here where all of that snow and ice has been melted. 
Now, what happens is cosmic spherules, which are shown over here, all fall to the bottom of this well. Now, what is a cosmic spherule? A cosmic spherule is a bit of dust that enters the atmosphere, it reaches the melting point, but doesn't completely evaporate. So um, as it then slows down, it will cool and solidify, and it looks a bit like a glass marble. It is essentially um, a solidified molten drop of um, silica with metals in. So you can hoover these out of here, it's about 100 meters down, and come up with a global input of these cosmic spherules over this sort of size range. And um, so we now have three inputs, sodium and iron at the top and cosmic spherules at the bottom. The three different sources that I told you about, Jupiter family, comets, asteroids, Halley type, they have somewhat different size ranges and velocities. Um, asteroids, because they come from nearby in the solar system, they mostly enter very slowly up here, around 11 kilometers a second. I realize that's relatively slowly. Halley, the Jupiter family is a bit faster, and the very fast ones have come from comets that are outside the solar system. So you can combine all of that um, to write down three simultaneous equations. The total flux of sodium is the flux from Jupiter comets, from asteroids, and from these long period Halley type comets with some coefficients. And then you have another equation for iron, another equation from cosmic spherules, three simultaneous equations, three unknowns, alpha, beta, gamma. You can solve them in principle anyway. And when all of that is done, uh, this is what you find. Here is the three different uh, sources of dust. That's the total of different things, unmelted micrometeorites, the cosmic spherules or the atoms. And the real uh, result is in red. So that's the total amount of dust that we estimate comes into the atmosphere every day, 28 tons. And most of it, you see over 70% is from the Jupiter family comets, which is consistent with the observations of the zodiacal cloud in the vicinity of Earth. And about 3%, 30% of that ablates into metals. Right. So now let me show you how you actually can uh, make some measurements of metals. Uh, I recently um, proposed that there would be a nickel layer in the upper atmosphere. And you can look for nickel using a laser that's tuned in the near ultraviolet fires up here, pulse laser. If it's at the right wavelength, the nickel atoms fluoresce and you can capture some photons down here, obviously a very small fraction of them with a telescope. And uh, from the time difference between when the pulse is launched here and when it arrives back here, of course you get the range where the nickel is. And so this is a cartoon showing what you would see in the, <clears throat> the lower and the middle atmosphere, photons are scattered uh, elastically by molecules of light, uh, of, of air. Not very efficient, but obviously there are a lot of them in the lower atmosphere, and this decreases exponentially with height. And then up here, you suddenly see this uh, fluorescence uh, peak from the nickel in the, in the layer. And that is indeed what you see here is the signal decreasing, then you see the resonance fluorescence, and then you go into the noise. And um, the spectroscopy of nickel, it's a transition element, uh, metal uh, element. For those of you who have, uh, are interested in that, it's quite complicated. You need to take care of all of that. But the bottom line is when you've done that, you can actually extract the absolute nickel concentration as a function of height. So these are the first, um, what we think are the, uh, are the correct measurements of the nickel layer. And um, having done that, you then want to understand why is there a nickel layer? So this is a, another of these uh, schemes that my group uh, built up over the last few years, studying a number of the important reactions of ions and neutrals with all of these things that occur in the atmosphere, in the upper atmosphere. Um, and that can go into the model Wacom. And this is what we predict should be the seasonal variation. So this is month height of this layer. And uh, here are some new measurements, which we published just last month uh, in collaboration with a group in Beijing in China. And you can see we get very nice agreement. 
First of all, there's a wintertime maximum, midsummer minimum. This is when the upper atmosphere is very cold, the opposite of the lower atmosphere. You see the height is correct, just below 85 kilometers. And even better, <clears throat> better is that we see nickel all the way down here below 80 kilometers in the model, uh, corroborating um, what is observed. So that just shows how a LIDAR system works. Now, what about the impacts in the atmosphere? Um, <clears throat> well, the first one, which is a very uh, beautiful uh, phenomenon, are noctilucent clouds. These are water ice clouds that occur very high up in the atmosphere. They were not seen before 1885, so in all of recorded history, and they're almost certainly um, an early warning of changing climate. Uh, furthermore, the water ice has to nucleate onto something, and the most likely thing are what are called meteoric smoke particles. So these are particles that form from the metal oxides, hydroxides, and so on, which like to stick together. They bind very strongly and polymerize into small nanometer size uh, particles, which are called uh, meteoric smoke. Okay. And <clears throat> what happened uh, at the end of the uh, 19th century was that this uh, volcano on Krakatoa in Indonesia essentially blew up in a massive eruption. So you can see the before and after. After, the, uh, the whole um, volcano is essentially blown a lot of dust and water vapor into the stratosphere because there's a lot of seawater under here. So big injection of water. And this was an early but very important paper which showed uh, a record over the late 19th and the 20th century of sightings of the, this new type of cloud. So they appeared here when the volcano erupted, nothing before then. And then you can see over the course of the 20th century, they're getting brighter and brighter occurring more often. So this is a very important uh, climate change indicator. And NASA launched this um, satellite, the AIM satellite, to monitor these uh, clouds. And this just shows uh, a few years ago um, observations in November over uh, Antarctica. You can see the outline of Antarctica here, and it's ringed by these clouds. They only form at high high latitudes in summertime when it's very, very cold because the atmosphere is very dry. So you have to go way down in temperature below 150 Kelvin to form. So that's uh, one uh, reason why cosmic dust is important. Um, the reason, by the way, that they are, have been increasing uh, recently is because water vapor is increasing. This uh, plot here shows methane from the Middle Ages up to the present. You can see this exponential increase recently, um, well, recently after the Industrial Revolution. Methane in the middle atmosphere is converted into water, and this is why the clouds are brighter. There's more water now to condense uh, on these uh, meteoric smoke particles so that they can be observed. The upper atmosphere is also getting colder because in the lower, well, in the lower atmosphere, as everybody knows, greenhouse gases trap heat. But in the upper atmosphere, the same molecules like CO2 export heat to space because they radiate in the infrared. So the increase in greenhouse gas in the upper atmosphere is making uh, the upper atmosphere colder. That's a measured thing. You now come down into the stratosphere now. There's another type of cloud which appears at high latitudes this time in winter. And these are these rather beautiful mother of pearl or nacreous clouds, um, or their more boring uh, scientific name is polar stratospheric clouds. And they are essentially droplets of nitric acid, sulfuric acid, and water. Um, and these freeze at rather high temperatures. So if you were to go into your lab and make up a mixture of these three uh, uh, things here, and put them in a fridge and cool them down, <clears throat> you will not get them to freeze anywhere near that temperature. You've got to go a lot lower. So the big uh, question is, what is making these freeze and make and form these uh, potostratospheric clouds? The reason that they're important, these clouds, is because chlorine uh, species, which are normally chemically inert, 
react with each other on the cloud surface and that then activates the chlorine to cause an ozone hole at the end of the polar night, the winter. Um, so what we have here are um, meteoric smoke, which I've already talked about, which is coming down the polar vortex during the winter. There are also fragments, which I'll talk about in a moment. This is where a cosmic dust particle breaks up into fragments before it ablates. And these also come raining down here. And if they're quite small, they'll stop in the lower stratosphere and they could also be responsible for freezing. So in the lab, we've looked at that uh, using various surrogates or bits of meteorite. And <clears throat> what you can see here is a Petri dish with drops of these uh, nitric acid water in this case. And in these drops are uh, very small amounts. You can see 0.4% of some fragmented meteorite, which we've put in here. And that's what it looked like. And then as you start to drop the temperature, some of them freeze. You can see some of these uh, have turned uh, darker. And you can make a plot of the fraction that have frozen as you drop the temperature. So if they're pure, nothing uh, it put into the droplets, you see they don't freeze below 190 Kelvin and you have to go almost down to um, 180 Kelvin before all of them freeze. But when you put these bits of uh, meteorite or surrogates of meteoric smoke in, you can raise the freezing temperature considerably and this will now explain why these um, mother of pearl clouds form and chlorine activation follows. So that's a rather important uh, impact. This is a high speed video from a collaborator, Margaret Campbell Brown at the uh, University of Western Ontario. Um, she uh, is able to actually take these pictures of uh, a meteor entering the atmosphere and you can quite clearly see as this flies along, it's fragmenting into smaller pieces. And the question is, what is gluing together the fragments? Uh, and from um, looking at videos like that and piecing them back to the start of the flight of the particle, you can tell that they are breaking apart around 900 Kelvin. Um, and it's, it appears that there is very refractory organic material, so almost like a tar that you put on roads, that is the glue holding together those grains that then break apart. So we built another meteoric ablation simulator to look at this. We put our meteoric, meteoritic fragments here. This little trap door opens, they fall down, funnel down onto a hot plate at a set temperature, and then we measure the rate at which uh, gases like CO2 and SO2 are produced from the pyrolysis, that is the burning up in the presence of oxygen of these organics. And um, this just shows the fraction of carbon dioxide that's emitted. So this will eventually uh, go up to one here with time. <clears throat> um, and this is done at uh, nearly a thousand Kelvin. So this is the sort of temperature where this fragmentation occurs. Um, and when you try to fit the kinetics of this, it's quite clear that there are two components here. Um, and these are, um, if anybody in the audience is interested in meteoritics, they'll know that uh, these are referred to as the soluble and insoluble organics uh, found in meteorites. Uh, so these pyrolyze at, at different temperatures and speeds. You can see one of them is pyrolyzing very slowly, the other one very uh, relatively quickly. And when you add those two together, you can fit the um, observation. So. The next uh, point in our research on this is to verify that is the case. And I, so I ran some simulations for this uh, radar here, which was the best, the most powerful radar in the world for observing uh, meteors, the Arecibo uh, radio telescope. Unfortunately, it was damaged in a hurricane and now the National Science Foundation in the US has decided to close it down. But there are other uh, radars which are approaching its uh, performance. And this is what uh, we predict. So this is the radar signal to noise as a function of height for a, a 20 microgram particle. So this would be 
uh, a fairly common particle entering at three different velocities. The black is very, it's relatively slow, the blue very fast, 30 in the middle. And <clears throat> the solid line is the signal you would see if the organics pyrolyze, because the CO2 and so on that is, is ejected from the particle will then hit an air molecule at high speed and ionize. So that generates electrons and radar echo. Uh, and the, the dashed line here, for instance, is if you don't have that pyrolysis going on. And you can see uh, in all cases, you get uh, early pyrolysis up here. So the pyrolysis occurs above where the metals ablate because the particle is still, remember, around eight or 900 Kelvin. It doesn't have to have melted at 1800 K. Uh, but in the slow case, you actually do see a sort of separate layer, which might well be observable. So it would be nice to actually uh, confirm that. Right, I'll now uh, talk for a little bit about phosphorus, which is our most recent um, element of interest. Phosphorus is a key biological element. So those of you who know who dance biology know it's uh, involved in replication, metabolism, and so on. And on the Earth's surface, most phosphorus is in the form of phosphate where the phosphorus is in oxidation state five. But phosphate <clears throat> is characterized by being bi biologically not very available. It's got low water solubility, not reactive, doesn't recycle quickly. Um, so it's limiting if you're trying to understand how uh, life might develop on a planet. Now, the reduced forms of phosphorus, particularly in the plus three state, so this is phosphite here, are much more soluble, much more reactive, and so they are uh, bioavailable. And during the early Earth, uh, phosphorus would have been required. And the interesting question is, is the forms in which it arrived. All previous work to ours really focused on the delivery of phosphorus as metal phosphites in meteorites. So these would crash into the ground, and then water chemistry would leach out the phosphorus and it would get into the um, um, uh, biology. But we uh, recognize that most of the extraterrestrial phosphorus is actually in these little particles, the cosmic dust particles. This is actually a, 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 an electron micrograph of one um, captured in the stratosphere. NASA had a, 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 a high altitude aircraft campaign for many years to catch these. And of course, if these, uh, if most of these evaporates, this is one that would have entered very slowly and survived, but if most of them evaporate, that is injecting phosphorus into the upper atmosphere. So we've had a program to understand that. Um, and the first thing we wanted to know is what it actually is the form of phosphorus in cosmic dust. So we took some of those um, uh, uh, interplanetary dust particles from the NASA collection to the Diamond Synchrotron in Oxfordshire in the UK. Uh, this is our beam line over here. And we performed X-ray fluorescence mapping on them. And um, the first question was, is it phosphide, as many people believed, or is it actually oxidized phosphate? Well, this here uh, shows the um, the XRF result. There is what phosphide would look like. This is the mineral schreibersite. And all of the uh, particles we looked at and interrogated these phosphorus hotspots is all very clearly phosphate. Uh, the, the sort of judge really is appetite down here. So uh, that then enabled us to investigate the ablation of phosphorus using the meteoric ablation simulator, which I've already shown you. So that gave us an injection of phosphorus into the atmosphere. We then carried out similarly a uh, kinetic uh, study of a lot of important reactions here, developed a scheme. And <clears throat> what we predict is that phosphorus is deposited in the world as shown in the map over here. The first thing you'll see is most of it is deposited along these storm tracks at mid latitudes in both hemispheres. At mid latitudes, you get a lot of folding between the stratosphere and the troposphere, and you get efficient transport of material from the upper atmosphere into the troposphere and then deposition. So that's why you have those two bands. 
But in addition, you'll see that where you have high mountains, the Rockies, the Himalayas, uh, down here where we have the Andes, is where most of the deposition actually occurs. And 11% of it, we predict, is biologically available. So it's now interesting to look at the early Earth using the same model to see uh, if that is any different. I should just mention that another um, a very important element, of course, is iron. And there are parts of the ocean in particular that are iron deficient, the Southern Ocean here, some parts of the North Pacific gyre. And this is where we predict iron would be deposited. Uh, there's been an important recent paper from a group at the um, National Institute of Oceanography in Goa, Rudra Swami et al, uh, who have looked at this in more detail, including the uh, possible leaching of iron out of cosmic spherules. Uh, so this is still an ongoing topic. The point is, if you put more iron in here and you encourage biology, you will draw down uh, carbon dioxide because you increase the population of phytoplankton. And so this then feeds back on climate. There was a proposal at one point to dump a lot of iron off uh, um, as iron sulfate off ships in the Southern Ocean to encourage phytoplankton here to draw down CO2 and help to counter climate change. Right, so in the last few minutes, uh, we'll move off world and uh, just look at a few other, well, one, one other body in particular. Um, we have looked at the um, impacts of cosmic dust in these three uh, solar system bodies. Uh, Venus uh, is interesting because, as you probably know, at the surface, um, it's extremely hot, uh, over 700 Kelvin. And the meteoric smoke that comes down from aloft is actually able to catalyze the oxidation of CO by O2. Um, and funnily enough, we are now um, looking at this as a possible uh, automobile catalyst um, as a cheap substitute to uh, using palladium and platinum catalysts. Um, Titan uh, is very cold, uh, said it's a moon around uh, Saturn and we showed that benzene is produced from acetylene there. So that's, uh, I mean, these are all published if people are particularly interested or just email me about that. Uh, but I want to focus on Mars now. Um, and um, we are involved in this NASA spacecraft uh, called MAVEN, uh, which was sent to Mars principally to understand why Mars lost all of its atmosphere. It, it quite probably had uh, a fairly dense atmosphere, perhaps even oceans uh, during the uh, early part of the solar system. And the question is why it managed to lose that. And just after MAVEN arrived in 2014, Mars was almost hit by uh, a comet called Siding Spring, named after the Australian observatory where it was uh, first uh, discovered. And uh, this shows uh, the comet coming along here. And here is Mars. At one point, it was thought it would hit it. But in the end, it just brushed past 138,000 kilometers away, so closer than uh, the moon is to us. And this shows an oblique view. So there's the invariant plane of the solar system. There goes siding spring. The fact that it has a trajectory like that tells you that it's come from the Oort cloud and it isn't going to be coming back. That's the so-called um, hyperbolic, not an elliptical orbit. So on board MAVEN is um, an instrument called the Imaging Ultraviolet uh, Spectrograph, the IUVS, and it basically uh, captures optically uh, emissions from the atmosphere as a function of height. So uh, that's what is uh, shown over here. And this is just a, a sort of composite of many different scans of uh, using that instrument. So what happened was, uh, well, as the comet approached, NASA and the other space agencies hid all of their space assets behind Mars because they worried that, you know, it would, they would be damaged by the comet. And then as soon as the comet had flown past, they were switched on again, re-emerged and... Um, so this is what um, the IUBS instrument saw. What you have here is a spectrum. So that's intensity versus wavelength, the near ultraviolet. 
And you see, if, I mean, this is what you'd see if you took a spectrum uh, at any time of Mars atmosphere, there are various bands from CO2 because that's the main constituent of Mars atmosphere. But immediately after the comet passed, it looked like that. So if I just switch these backwards and forwards, you can see uh, very obviously, you don't need complex maths, see a huge peak here from magnesium ions, a small one from atomic, from neutral magnesium, and there's also some iron there. So this was the effect of the comet on the atmosphere. And it's been very interesting to see where all of this material then went, because it's only one side of the atmosphere uh, of the planet that got a dusting, if I can use that um, highly technical term. Um, so, so, so following where these went is a very nice tracer um, to understand the dynamics of the atmosphere. But my job uh, in this study was uh, to model how much magnesium was, uh, ions were produced and hence how much material came into the atmosphere. And I came up with an estimate of somewhere between 40 and 120 visible shooting stars every second. Unfortunately, um, it was also dusty in the lower atmosphere of Mars, so the, the rovers on the surface couldn't see the upper atmosphere, or they might have seen something like this. So this was the last great Leonid meteor storm, um, which was seen over North America in 1833, thousands of shooting stars a minute, so similar to that. And this is a wood cutting showing what was observed. So um, a Martian, had they been able to see the upper atmosphere would have been in for a treat. Um, now, in order to do that estimate, of course, I had to construct one of these, um, uh, diagrams of all the chemistry that's involved. And um, the, the point here is that uh, you have magnesium ions, various uh, thing clustering with CO2 in principle, and then you form magnesium carbonate down here. Um, the thing about magnesium carbonate is it has a huge electric dipole moment. For those of you who are physical chemists, dipole moments over 12 Dubai, which is extremely unusual. And it means that carbon dioxide and water love to bind to this. And you'll see the relevance of that in a moment. Anyway, um, there is, <clears throat> besides the excitement of the uh, near uh, the flyby of the comet, there is a continuous input of cosmic dust and there is a global layer of magnesium ions which are the measurements that are shown here with the symbols. And this is my model fit to that using that um, chemistry scheme that I just showed you. So armed with that, one can then um, think about uh, this phenomenon. Now, these are noctilucent clouds <coughs> on Mars. Um, in fact, NASA just this today has released uh, some beautiful videos showing these clouds scudding along in the sky. They're very thin, hard to see, so it, it needed some very uh, complex data processing. But the point is, <clears throat> the upper atmosphere of Mars is around 80 kilometers. The temperature falls low enough that CO2 itself, the main constituent of the atmosphere, can um, plate out onto meteoric smoke and make uh, these bluish clouds. Um, and uh, here's the, uh, one of the rovers that uh, took that, uh, of the kind that took that picture. So you have this CO2, uh, uh, sorry, the carbonate here, as I said, CO2 can jump onto it and that's then replaced by water. And you very quickly build up an embryonic ice particle onto which if the temperature then falls low enough, the, the carbon dioxide itself um, plates out uh, and condenses on it and you get uh, a visible ice particle. So to conclude, um, well, after 10 years of work, we've decided that the total dust input into the terrestrial atmosphere is around 28 uh, tonnes per day. That's a lot better than somewhere between three and 300. Um, most of it comes from the short period Jupiter family comets. Um, we can explain using the um, meteoric ablation simulator why there's so little sodium, uh, calcium, for example, relative to sodium. Um, 
meteoric smoke particles almost certainly not to uh, nucleate, not to loosen uh, clouds. And we've shown that they can freeze uh, acidic droplets in the stratosphere, which impacts on the ozone layer uh, and may also produce um, a, uh, an important source of iron in the Southern Ocean that competes with the input from uh, dust. Uh, from, from deserts like the um, Atacama. Uh, this uh, source of bioavailable phosphorus is a very interesting new angle, uh, which I say we're working on at the moment. Uh, there are clearly these interesting impacts in other atmospheres and uh, in particular Mars. So that's uh, the end of my lecture. It's obviously been, you know, covered a lot of different things and, um, I appreciate, you know, it had to go fast and so on, uh, but I'm very happy to answer questions and say it doesn't have to be now, you know, please email if you've got a question about anything uh, that occurs to you later. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor John, for such an elucidating talk and explaining such complicated topics in such a lucid manner out there. Thank you very much. Uh, there are a few questions uh, which are there in the chat section. Okay. Uh, yeah. Right. So we'll let's be kind enough that. to take up one or yeah. two. Yeah. Let me just find them here. Um, asteroids contain metals. Should we plan or dream for asteroid to avail metals? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a very topical question. Uh, I mean, uh, asteroid returns have just started. Uh, the first Japanese return uh, has happened, and there's an American spacecraft that is, is going to be bringing back some samples as well. Um, yeah, why not dream? I like that word. Um, I mean, obviously, they need to be metals that are in short supply on Earth uh, to make it uh, commercially viable, but sure. Uh, can human life survive on Mars? Um, I wouldn't rush to, <laughs> to Mars. <laughs> it's um, the surface pressure is only uh, six uh, millibars. So it's um, approximately uh, uh, whatever, five, uh, 50 times, no, whatever. We're a thousand millibars, so six. Um, is you know seven uh, uh, seventy times less or something eighty times less, um, and it's very dry. I, I mean, obviously Elon Musk is determined to go, or at least send somebody there. Uh, I'm sure China wants to do that. Maybe even India has long you know plans too. Um, I, I think we should certainly go there. Uh, it's very important, I think, for humans to explore and keep exploring new frontiers. And this is an obvious one. Um, so the answer is you can survive. Um, and particularly if there is enough water, subterranean water, then you can use that to do various things like generate oxygen and obviously provide water for growing plants or, um, uh, uh, well, for, um, electrolysis, all that kind of thing. Uh, can you comment on? atmospheric science, earth science, and oceanic science. Um, can you comment? I'm not quite sure what uh, that means. I mean, uh, as I've shown you, all of these different uh, aspects, uh, you have to sort of embrace in this field because um, although I'm, well, I'm a physical chemist originally, and I mostly work on atmospheric science, I've had to sort of get involved in in both earth science for understanding meteoritics, that kind of thing, and ocean science, for instance, for looking at these uh, impacts of iron. Mm -hmm. um, slides, well, the, the lecture has been recorded, so there will be a, um, a YouTube video of that. Um, so that's fine. Um, I mean, I can also turn the talk into a PDF if people would like that. Um, good. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor John. And okay. uh, on behalf of the National Academy of Sciences, India, the chapter, and the host institution, the India Rupadhyay College, I would like to thank you for sparing your valuable time. And, and I also would pleasure. like to thank uh, all the attendees who have been there with us for attending mm -hmm. today's session. 
I'll be uploading the recording of uh, this particular session on the YouTube and will share with all of you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Sir. Okay. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.